So we were stopping with the activities that we want to try as far as being physical and being out there. So simple thing about our tips here. So you want to find the things that you may already be a part of. Again, simple stuff like walking around the neighborhood, taking the stairs, or getting off the bus at an earlier stop, right? So if you know the, the Safeway is a block and a half away, get off a half a block, walk over to the Safeway or, or something like that. And again, we don't say jump in. We don't expect you guys to dive in and do 45 minutes of an activity. What we do want you to do is just smart, small, five, 10 minute intervals. And then as you build your stamina and your strength up, you can continue that on, all right? And then try something fun for you to do. Uh, you want to add friends and family members to join in. That can be Zumba. That can be any activity, right? The idea is that as you get older, we become really set in our ways and become a little bit sedentary. So it's harder for us to do stuff. And we just don't want to try to pack everything into the weekends. We want to do more things throughout the week. So we have that opportunity to live healthier longer. All right. So let's talk about this. So when we're talking about eating healthy, it's real simple. Overall healthy diet will reduce your risk of many diseases. Again, a lot of the stuff that we're saying, although it's in the umbrella of Alzheimer's, is clear and present for any disease. We'll talk about that uh, in the next slide here. So as I said this before, and you hear this a lot, what is good for the heart is also good for the brain. We want you to think about nutritious fuel, uh, food that is fuel for the brain and making sure that you're uh, diet is balanced. It will reduce your risk of heart disease, cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and diabetes. So just like smoking is a direct correlation to the effects of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, what we put in our bodies from a nutrition standpoint also is a direct correlation to the development of the disease. Again, it's not that it's going to happen if you don't, but if you have a sedentary lifestyle mixed with the fact that you're not active, mixed with the fact that you're eating poor foods, all of those things in conjunction could potentially lead to you in developing the disease. So let's talk about this in more detail. When we're talking about uh, examples of a balanced nutrition, we're talking about a DASH diet, right? We're talking a Mediterranean diet. What does that mean, really? You can Google those particular two diets, but what we're really saying is having more fruits and vegetables, right? More greens and more stuff of color on your plate. You got to look like a rainbow. I want to see some carrots. I want to see some celery. I want to see some greens. I want to see a lot of those things. We want to see some nuts, some beans, and some whole grains. Be looking at leaner meats, such as fish and poultry. Healthier fatty foods, instead of getting 100% of a steak, maybe get half of that, right? And then really, we're talking about what we put as far as our seasoning, limiting salt and sugar, right? Again, I talk about my, my family a lot because I grew up around food. You know, when we make grains, what we put in the grains? We put some type of pork in the grains to make sure that it has flavor, mm -hmm. right? But what's the alternative to that? Maybe not pork, finding a turkey alternative, Nothing. making sure that we season it a different way. So all of those subtle things that help us have a better balanced, nutritious diet. Okay? So again, when we're talking about that, what are the questions are we asking ourselves? How can you cook differently to make the meals healthier? What healthy foods can I swap in? Again, it's not about taking things out. It's just about taking things out that may be an overindulgence or an overabundance and substituting it for something else. So still eat your chicken and your pork and your steak and all those things. Eat it in moderation and then find something to pair it with. So if I have a carb like a meat or potatoes, I need to have some greens. I need to have some salad. I need to make sure that I have something healthy on the plate. And always be willing to try something new as far as your foods, right? Stepping out of our comfort zone, you know, switching from rice to quinoa, something of that nature. So what are our tips? Use olive oil instead of uh, butter. We're talking about using sodium-free spices instead of salt, right? Focus on what you can add in. Yes. Going back to my point earlier, such as fruits and veggies, studying what to take away. And see, when we talk about diets and when people come to you and say, you can't eat this, you shouldn't eat that, that's somebody coming in and telling you what you take away. That's not our approach. If you've been eating something for 30 years, you're less likely to take that away and be resistant to taking that away. 
my conversation and my piece is to say, no, still eat it, eat less of it, and then add something in that makes it healthier overall, right? You want to build your meals around vegetables, beans, and whole grains, and then we want to also make sure we're choosing leaner cuts of meat, okay? So we always talk about this because this comes up a lot. You'll see a lot of commercials talking about, oh, this thing helps with overall brain health, something called pregnizone, pregnogen. You'll see this on TV, right? If it's not FDA approved, it probably doesn't work. Um, so we always say be aware, be aware of potential false claim, right? We'd rather you focus on balanced nutrition, things you can see like food um, that you know that you have, that you know what it takes to promote a healthy uh, brain and body. And always talk to healthcare professionals about any nutritional deficit. So if you are lacking vitamin D or vitamin Z or zinc or iron or something like that, make sure they are telling you what to get. You don't want to get anything off of TV, right? Some things are uh, made to sell, but not made to eat. That's what somebody told me the other day, that some things are just not, they're advertised in a way that makes you want to buy it, but in actuality, they're not good for you. And we're really cognizant about that when it comes to food um, or any type of medicines of that nature. So going back to our challenge, challenging your brain will help you lower your risk of cognitive decline. So reading, Sudoku, newspaper, things of that nature that keeps that brain active and stimulated Ooh. does have a direct link to lowering cognitive decline. So as we're getting close to the end, we always wanna talk about challenging yourself. Challenge your mind for both short-term and long-term benefits for your brain. So what do we mean when we're talking about cognitive engagement? Well, you're doing that right now, right? Cognitive engagement is a term that means we're keeping the minds active and challenged, right? Going to informationals, going to health fairs, asking questions, reading, engaging on an iPad, reading articles, right? This could be a number of different things. Learning a new skill or challenging yourself with a task is engaging in ongoing learning. So we want to make sure that we're always doing that. So this is what we know about the science of this and why this is important. Keeping your mind active forms new connections among the brain cells, right? That's why we want you to do it. It keeps the brain and the brain cells active and flowing, right? The cognitive engagement also encourages blood flow to the brain. Anything that is mentally stimulating activities such as chess or checkers or something that causes you to use your brain power possibly can maintain or improve cognition as we age. And engaging in informal education may keep your brain healthy and can provide protection against developing dementia. So reading a book, learning those things, these are things that are helpful. These are the three questions I want you to think about. What new hobbies or skills do you want to learn? What activities sound like a fun challenge? And what topics would I like to learn more about? So I'm always learning, you never stop learning. So what are those things that will keep me engaged that will make me want to think? So what is it that I don't know that I can learn more today, right? I'm learning new math, not because I want to learn new math, because my daughter is learning new math, right? So is that's one way that I'm keeping myself actively engaged in doing other things. And the stuff that I want to do for myself and the stuff I want to do with my wife. So those are the things that are constantly keeping me stimulated that challenges me to want to think and learn. And the same thing you all are doing right now. So let's talk about those tips. You know, for some of us who are on the educational side and we want to learn more, go to community college, take something at UDC or UDCC, mm -hmm. or do something at the community center does offer for free, right? Like, the, like this program. Try a new cooking technique, learning a new language. If you are a person who likes to work with the hands, building a new piece of furniture or learning to play a new strategy game like chess and Sudoku. My, uh, my in-laws are big spades players. I grew up yeah. with hearts. So mm -hmm. there's always a competition of big wits and hearts and spades in this game and that That's game. Good. And that is challenging that. because some people play it one way, other people play it another way. And now you're combining all these things that you got to think and have to strategize. That's another way of keeping that brain engaged and active. So staying connected, and this is something I wanna really focus on in the time that we have left. So connecting with others 
uh, will have health benefits. And what we're doing now on this call is us connecting. So you wanna make sure you're staying socially active because that supports brain health. Social engagement, is associated with living longer with fewer disabilities. And those people who feel connected, like they have a community, a family, whether that's through this group or through the church or the local community center, are more likely to make healthier choices in other areas, right? Because you have a team and a sphere of influence that are is affecting you in the positive, right? So the questions that we're asking ourselves is, how do I like staying connected to others? Some people like to talk on the phone. Some people, because you guys have iPads, like to do FaceTime. Some people like to be out in public when the weather is nice. So we're getting ready for a cherry blossom season. Oh, we're going to go take a trip down to the cherry blossoms on the mall. Or we want to go to the museum. Or we want to go to lunch, right? Finding ways to get involved in your community, community centers, church, other civic associations. And then at those same places, are there any clubs or groups I would like to join? I, like I said, I grew up here, so there are certain things that I know and certain things that I don't know. So I know I can fish, but I can't grill. So at my church, there's a grilling group of, uh, with the men at my church. I'm learning how to grill. I want to be able to say that I can cook the same way that my grandfather did. So those are the things that I'm doing to keep myself engaged and just having that social connection with other members of my church. So here are our tips. You want to volunteer for a cause that's important to you. So finding something to do, whether that's on the political side or the local side. I heard some people talking about you know, some of the campaigns and maybe canvassing for those folks. Or if you just want to keep it simple, schedule a regular phone call or video chats to stay chat. So I'm assuming all of you guys talk or talk outside of these calls. So I'm going to talk to Ms. Mildred every Friday at five o'clock. We're just going to catch up on our week, right? Scheduling that phone call to have that social connectivity and engagement is very important. You want to always make sure that you're visiting family and friends and that you're just participating in local community events, whether that's a picnic or something around the area that is safe for you. So as a recap, you can live healthier for your brain and body if you incorporate all of these things. You want to make sure that we're getting quality sleep between six to eight hours, right? You want to be smoke-free, so no tobacco, none of that entering your body. Please, please take care of your mental health. Know when to say when, know when to have self-care, know when that you physically need a break, right? You want to make sure that you're getting moving, whether that's just walking around the neighborhood or working out or doing stuff at your local community center. You want to make sure that you're eating healthy. That does not mean you go on a diet and you take out all the things you love. That means that you eat those things in moderation and that you find healthy alternatives and substitutes for food that may not be as healthy. You want to challenge yourself cognitively, stimulating that brain. If that's playing chess, if that's playing spades, if that's playing checkers, if that's reading a new book, whatever that is for you, you make sure you find that thing for you and you do it. And then last but not least, staying connected, having a community of individuals that support you, that you can talk to, that you can walk with, that you can work out with, that you can pray with, whatever it is that you need that this individual, this community, this church can provide you, you do that and you stay connected because all of these things are important and all of these things help keep dementia and Alzheimer's at bay. So if you get to sleep, you smoke free, you take care of your mental health, you get moving, you eat healthy, you challenge yourself and you stay connected, you will see a better quality of life and you will put yourself at a less likely risk to develop the disease as we get older and as we age. So as always, as we wrap up, we always talk about how we from the association can help. So we have our 24 seven helpline, 800-272-3900, staffed by uh, master clinicians and level technicians that talk about the disease. If you have any questions or you just want tips, we're here to help. You can always find us online at alz.org if you have any questions. And then our community resource finder, if you're looking to get tests, if you're looking for any assistance, you find us at communityresourcefinder.org. That is a partnership that we have with AARP where we can find local services by zip code within a 30 mile radius or less where you live. 
So with that, I'll stop the presentation. I know there are some questions, so I want to make sure I got through it, but left enough time so as to have a conversation. So. Ms. James, do you want to facilitate that? And if not, I'll just go by the hand. So I'll start with Ms. Dennis. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so glad to see you back again. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment. You stated something that I had been dealing with with relatives and I told him, I said, get my brother up and move him around. Get him to take a walk up the street, move around. And uh, he likes music. So we've been playing music and he, he can, he's back to singing now, mm -hmm. singing the, uh, the tunes and stuff. So um, I, 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 I'm glad that I'm in tune with what you were saying that we should do with people who have Alzheimer's. I just want to thank you for bringing this on because it's a great help to those of us who are dealing with loved ones. Yes, ma'am. I'm happy to and help. God yes. bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yes, again, there are things that we can do and there's simple changes. We are, we're never going to tell you to do something that comes at a significant cost to you because really what it is, especially with someone with the disease, is that if you just add things back to their routine, you'll see some changes, especially if you get them early enough. Everybody still can remember the a song from the time in their past when they were growing up. And that way, the, it allows you to connect with them in a significant way. So if you're doing those things as a family, as an individual, um, you still have the ability to connect with them in a, in a meaningful way. So I'm glad to hear that that is working. It does. It, it does. And, and our church has a, a seniors in once a month and gives us a luncheon, a mass or luncheon and, and people to talk to us like you or other people. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, it's a, a great time to communicate with other people. Definitely. A lot Thanks. of us are, are like in a home by ourselves with only the aides and nurses. So I just, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you, Ms. McCoy. Yes, good afternoon, how are you? I'm well. That's great. That's great. Um, I have a question. Uh, being a a uh, past healthcare aide mm -hmm. and working with Alzheimer patients, I I'm under the impression that, well, I was told, or I read it somewhere, that the uh, brains, the the part of the brain that governs music and dirty words, mm -hmm. is the last thing to go. Mm -hmm. um, now, I had a client that related a story to me numerous of times every day. Mm -hmm. The story he would tell me um, was that he was in a fight and he would thump somebody. Mm -hmm. But when he was playing, when he was playing his piano in the music room, it turned to he beat his A. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time it, that was, you know, it was when he was not doing music. It was like, I thumped him. Mm -hmm. But when he was doing music, and this was each and every time, it turned, um, it turned to, he, he used profanity. Mm -hmm. So is that, a, you know, is that true? Is that the, is that true? The brain, the, the, the section of the brain that deals with uh, music? And, so it's not, um, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. So let me answer in this way. It's not that it's a particular section of the brain per se. What it is, is that as you, as you're talking about, there are certain things that are the last things to go. So we want to be real clear about this. So the mm -hmm. first thing to go that is significant for anybody with dementia or Alzheimer's or any of the other type of dementias is short term memory. First thing to go. So if it just happened, you're going to get that repetitiveness of them asking the same question over and over again. As you go deeper into the disease, middle to late, then to your point, there are certain things that stay longer. And so whatever that connection is, whether it's music, whether it's uh, a particular activity they like, and the way they speak the language or languages in general, that does 
typically be the last thing to go. So what we talked about, and in, in, I think in our last session last month, right, I gave the example of one of our volunteers whose wife was, you know, an avid member of the church and didn't cuss. And then as she progressed through the disease, cussed like a sailor, right? Because again, it's not necessarily her, but it's that the condition she's in due to the disease has changed her a little bit and her personality has changed. So there is some correlation between that um, in that way where you see somebody kind of be sweet and sour, they become like Sour Patch Kids, or in the morning they're nice and in the evenings they're mean, or if something happens and their day goes left, they change. So there is a connection to that. But also uh, to Mrs. Dennis's point, music has always been the connection, especially when you're talking about people of color, they can always remember or have a connection to a place or a person or a thing with music. And so if that is the thing that brings them comfort, then you will always see this gravitation, whether that memory is positive or negative to that particular thing. So yes, to your point, there is something to be said about that. It's not always true, but more likely than not, there's a deep connection between uh, folks with the disease and something with music or something with food or you know, a photograph or something like that. Yeah, well, yes, and I, and I use music therapy Mm -hmm. in, in my in my in my daily routines yes ma'am and there is is something about the eyes of an alzheimer patient they go and i don't like and this is for lack of a better term they go dead mm -hmm. like there's nothing they don't they, they go dead mm -hmm. and as soon as you put on the music or sing songs to them the eyes actually brighten up and um they become, you know, they become in and now, so to speak. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and actually it's like they, 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 they sing, and you're right, they sing songs, mm -hmm. you know, um, they they remember songs from years ago They, you know, and it, and then they, then you can come Then I learned I could communicate with them at those times, but when their eyes were, or oh, someone said flat, when their eyes were flat, um, they were there it was no communication at all yeah i completely understand yes and, and you know there's the side effect there's something called sundowning sundowning happens where again they're really active during the day but as the sun sets they become kind of despondent and kind of um uh but a little bit of recluse and they want to be by themselves so they become just kind of uh separatist so like there are a lot of different effects when mm -hmm. it comes to the disease where you'll see certain things and again it's mm -hmm. not typical of everybody because one person can respond to the disease in a completely different way right, than the other right. individual. So there are just things that we know that are tried and true, usually search our memory, but we also know that music and music therapy is a big uh, healer, as it were, when it comes to those going and suffering from the disease as well. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gregory. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you explain the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah. And how do you tell the difference? So um, we defined this in our last meeting. So dementia is the umbrella term. So every person who suffers from Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. So dementia is the understanding of a, a cognitive brain changes over time in the period of brain. And then the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's. You also have common forms such as frontal temporal lobe dementia, you have uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, there's a, several other ones. The most famous example of not Alzheimer's recently in the news is Bruce Willis, who had asphagia, which is a form of dementia. And then as he progressed, he has now what's called frontal temporal lobe dementia. So dementia is the umbrella term for cognitive decline. And then once the cognitive decline becomes more significant past the early stage, then the person's even developing some form of Alzheimer's, frontal temporal lobe dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies. And we say all that to say that basically the cognitive decline in the brain um, and where the cognitive decline in the brain is occurring is what determines what disease they have. So frontal temporal lobe dementia, it attacks the front part of the brain. Then you have uh, dementia with Lewy bodies that's attacks the cerebellum. And then you have the cerebral cortex that is attacked as well. And then Alzheimer's encompasses all three of those elements of the brain. So just to make sure we're clear, 
Alzheimer's is a form of dementia that attacks the brain. And then you have other variant forms of dementia um, that I just described. So there, that's the difference. Dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Does that mean that having Alzheimer's, if a person has dementia, that it's a better to have Alzheimer's because it may be somewhat treatable uh, and therefore, if, you, if you've got dementia, you hope you've got Alzheimer's. Is that true? I wouldn't say that. I would say that because for uh, when it comes to dementia, but especially Alzheimer's, there is no cure. Now, there are things on the market that we can do to treat it, i.e. basically slow the progression of the disease down. But that's the most we can do at this moment. There's a new drug on the market that has passed FDA trials, but are not approved where we've seen it um, have some effects on the brain as far as the, the disease not being as aggressive, but one, it hasn't passed every step yet. And two, that particular drug is $20,000. So I wouldn't say that it is better to have it, right? The idea is that we don't have any of it, but depending on the condition of the individual or what's going through, some people may say that. I wouldn't say that is more likely than that, but the goal is you want to have, if, if you're going to have any cognitive decline, you don't want it to be diagnosed or go past that initial stage. Once you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or frontal temporal lobe dementia or dementia of the bodies, we're talking about something that's incurable at that point. So I wouldn't say there's anything better, but it's just more so that there are certain things that we know more about it, so we know how to treat it, but it's definitely incurable. Are there any forms of dementia that are treatable? And if so, what does that type of treatment involve? So everything is treatable, it's just not curable. So when we talk about Alzheimer's specifically, you're talking about something called Algehelm, which is a pill. You have something called Lacanumab, which is an IV drop. Um, and all that does is that if you get diagnosed and we diagnose you early, what it does is slows down the effects of the disease in the brain. So if a person's diagnosed, we diagnose you in the early stage, you're approved to take one of those drugs. All it does is slows down the progression of the brain cells and the neurons dying in the brain. It does not change the condition of you having the disease. But that's the, that's the only difference there. So you still have it and you still will progress. It just slows down the progression happening rapidly compared to somebody who does not have access to those drugs and they may see where they may see a steeper decline in their condition. Okay, one other further question. That's fine. I have a good friend who has lost her near-term memory. It seems to be getting worse, mm -hmm. but she's still brilliant, yeah. but just doesn't have the near-term memory. Yeah. Uh, does that type of dementia, is that more treatable than other types of dementia? No. I wouldn't say that. So one of the things we know about dementia in general, um, as we talked about before, that it's um, the first thing to go is always going to be short-term memory. It doesn't matter what diagnosis or what form of dementia you have. That's the first thing that goes because it's the thing that happens recently. So although she can still remember things over a period of time or she can recall things, short-term memory, no matter what the diagnosis is, will always be affected because it's, the, it's, it's new information coming into the brain compared to old information that's stored over a period of time. So there's no particular way to avoid that because that is usually the first effect or sign of knowing that a person has the disease is that their short-term memory is severely hindered, but there's no cure for that as well. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Mrs. Smith? Yes, yeah, so I, I, what I gather is that Alzheimer's is not reversible. Mm -hmm. Dementia may be reversible. So dementia is the base. So it's not that it's reversible. It's just that it's kind of like the best way to describe it for you, and I don't want to compare diseases, but this is the only way that I can make it make sense. Um, there's HIV and AIDS. So there's a step before there's a step, right? So you get diagnosed with one and then become- You get full blow AIDS, I guess. Exactly. It. So that's essentially how dementia- So all of those 
all of those things that you mentioned. Yes, ma'am. Because some of them I do. Mm -hmm. um, the purpose of them is preventative for the brain. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that we should, should be doing now. Right. Instead of waiting for you to get it, because at that point, it, you, it's just a slow train. Right. And you gotta you gotta remember when we did these sessions, you know, two months ago when we first started, the people have the misconceived notion about Alzheimer's or dementia being a genetics thing, right? Genetics and family history only play a part if everybody or a particular lineage in your family has Alzheimer's or dementia. The greatest risk factor for developing dementia and Alzheimer's is age. So if we know that it's age and we know that it doubles every five years past the age of 65, then we know that all the things that we could be doing leading up as we age, because we're going to get older, if we are eating healthier, if we're uh, keeping our brains active, if not we smoking, are active, right, not smoking, exercising, if we're already doing those things now. Last then, thing I want to ask and get into, what mm -hmm. role does sexual activity in the uh, senior citizen populations play in dementia and Alzheimer's? We haven't seen any data or correlation uh, between sexual activity and the disease, not from my understanding. Um, so I don't wanna say something and be wrong, but I know that's not a topic or something that we've covered, nor has it been something that we've researched. So I don't have an answer for that. So people that are still sexually active, they don't see any difference in their dementia or whatever. Thank I would, you very yes, much. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And then Mrs. Boykins. You already answered my question. I already answered your question. I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. <laughs> no problem. Is there anyone else who has any questions? I want to make sure I get to everyone, um, regardless if you have hands up or not. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. My, my husband, he had a massive stroke. Mm -hmm. And he had the type of stroke that it hits you right then and there, and it's like like warning, you know. It's the type. I think he had a um, blood clot, mm -hmm. to the head or something. But anyway, I wanted to ask you because my mom had a massive stroke also, but his stroke was real severe. You know, they had to go in his head and everything. But okay. my mom, they didn't. Well, she had a slow leak on the on hers. Well, it was coming from her brain, but she was more, a little more alert. But with mm -hmm. him, it seemed like, well, see, after he had the stroke, it seemed like he would go back in the past, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. He would he would know some things, but I was wondering, Bill, is that a part of what you're saying now? Does that happen when you have strokes? And, or so what were Yes and no. And then let me answer this correctly. So yes and no. Yes, being that any traumatic brain injury or anything that happens physically in the body that changes or alters that can then lead to it. So we talked about this in our last session where CTE, um, which is uh, something that we see happen in football players, multiple concussions, anything that impacts the brain, a severe car accident, a stroke, those are things that can lead, it lend itself to you developing dementia and Alzheimer's, right? So mm -hmm. if you saw a cognitive change or decline due to a stroke, yes, because that's a pre-existing condition that changed yeah. and altered the molecular structure of beside him that then led to some cognitive decline, right? That's right. not necessarily mean Alzheimer's or dementia, but you just saw a change in his cognitive abilities. So yes, there is a correlation there. It's not mm -hmm. always lending itself to that person developing Alzheimer's or dementia, but anything that has changed or altered the body, especially from the tra any traumatic brain injury as such, which uh -huh. is a stroke that's caused, you can see a significant dip in their cognitive decline because of this. So there is a connection there, yes. Oh, and the COPD too, because I was mm -hmm. saying my father had that, remember? And he started, you know, doing things that you know, that we know he normally don't do because I guess he's losing oxygen from his, his you know, brunt because right. of the COPD. So that could cause it too. 
Yeah, there is a correlation there. Again, anything that changes the way the brain function, if you're losing, because we talked about that in the presentation, oxygen yeah. blood flow between the heart and the brain. Well, if you're losing, if that's at 20 to 25%, and then that drops in half, mm -hmm. then you're going to see some cognitive decline because of that. So it's not a direct link to Alzheimer's or dementia, but it is going to change the way the change the way the brain works and functions. Yes. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Of course. Is there anyone else? Good day. I've enjoyed this topic. This is Queen. Uh, I'm pet part of the iPad program as well. Um, I just want to say that when you realize that somebody might be suffering from Alzheimer's, how does the family and the person who's caring for that person, how do we help them? without um, anybody getting burnt out or you feeling you know, frustrated. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that self-care point we were talking about where you just have to know when to say when. Um, when the first thing we say, if you know the person or the family is uh, dealing with that, we always decide to have a conversation. So this is something that we do at the association, it's free. We sit down with the family and we essentially walk them through it. So it's like, tell us what's happening, tell us what you've noticed. Right. And from that conversation, especially if there's been any medical information, if you had them go take a memory test or something like that, then we sit down to sit down with them on the phone or a person to say, so this is where you this is where your loved one is in this process. You need to come up with a care team. Right. So that is the immediate family members who are obviously going to be the primary caregivers. And then they need to identify second secondary and third caregivers that can be a neighbor, that can be aunts and uncles, that can be people within the community, that can be the church family. And then everybody essentially take, plays a role and takes shifts, all right? You can do it by weeks, you can do it by days, you can do it by months, but essentially what you're trying to get them to do is have a team of individuals that can help shift the responsibility so it's not all in that person. So maybe, you know, for the month of March, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, the neighbor takes them to an appointment or, Mondays and Wednesdays, the grandkids do it or, they, or, or not, an uncle does it, right? Because whoever the primary is, especially if they're still working, they're going to need to be reassured that that person is going to be taken care of safe, but they also still need to work. So if they build a team of people that can help them out while they're still holding down a job, essentially, and then they're just dealing with them in the evenings, that is a significant burden off of their shoulders than having to figure out what to do with them during the day, right. how they're going to be taken care of during the day. I don't want to leave them at the house. Who's going to, so like it, it becomes a, yeah. a stress unto themselves. But if you sit down with a plan and you ask your friends, what can they realistically do to give you assistance and you all collectively decide on what that is, you'll see a, a greater level of success with that person's mental health and also with the person that you're helping take care of too, because that means you have a team of people who are stepping in to give that person assistance. And that's how we used to do my mom, me and my sister. We would take turns, and although she had a nurse, but after the nurse leave, then it was me and her turn and we would take turns, you know, cause we had a life also. So, yeah. you know, we had to make things work mm -hmm. where nobody won't get burnt out and yeah. you know, and if somebody else want to come in and help, it'd be good, you know, fine and fit with her. Like yeah, maybe yeah. we want to go out on weekends, so, you know. So you got to make a plan. You got to have a plan. All right. And then again, if you can't, if you don't have the assistance, there are adult daycare programs, there's respite care, right? There's so many options, right? But I right. always say find the things that are free first before you find the things that are the cost. Because right. the stress of that, trying to then manage and add another bill, essentially, to, right. a, to a monthly schedule is stressful too. So whatever you can do with, with okay. that's reasonable and free, that's definitely helpful. Right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Watson. Yes, Mr. Watson. Yes, uh, this has been a question I've had for a long time and okay. I hope you can answer it. Okay. Years ago, uh, we called it senility. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have had relatives that would forget words like words that they've known all their life mm -hmm. and it was hard for them it was hard for them to bring the words to the front right mm -hmm. or they would forget names mm 
Mm-hmm. But they were very much in, they were, they, they were forget a name, but they knew who you were. So is, was that a form of dementia? No. And I think that that's what happens, right? We do it. We <laughs> misdiagnose things all the time. So no, I wouldn't say that's a form of dementia. You got to think we're going to forget things, right? There, you know, I'm 35 and I forget things and it may right. take a minute for me to remember it and it may come back and it may not. So right. I wouldn't say that's a form of Alzheimer's and dementia. When we are talking about the disease, realistically, we are talking about significant things. Okay. Right. So forgetting a name and then not coming back to you or forgetting a name, but knowing the person. So if you know everything around or about the person, but you don't remember the name, that's not Alzheimer's and dementia. But we're talking about and the example we always usually give is like you make a dish from scratch. You've been making this dish from scratch for 30 years and Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you add an ingredient that does not belong in that dish. Right. Right. We're concerned. Because that right. means this is something you've done. And, you know, it's not for getting salt and pepper. You right. added shrimp to lasagna. Like, that's something where we got to like, okay, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. That's when we're kind of concerned. So, you know, people forgetting names. Um, because, again, that may be short-term memory or that may just be something in the moment. Or just maybe... Uh, um, They're Asian getting old. As well. Right, yeah. So, so, no, we wouldn't say that. But significant memory loss or changes that affect their daily life like paying the same bill five times, something like that, right? Right, the right, keys right. in the freezer, right. something like that. Right, right. You know, the, those, those right. things are what we're kind of looking for, yeah. But a lot of times, a lot of times people fear mm-hmm. because they forget a name or they can't bring up a word, they automatically think they have dementia. So maybe, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's very fright. that's very frightening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, as we age, we become more forgetful over time. That is just a natural part of life because that's what just happens. That's what happens with age. But the significant thing that we always talk about when we're trying to draw this line between Alzheimer's and dementia is we're talking about significant memory loss and changes right. in behavior yes. right. or thinking or something right. like that, something right. that is out of character for this person. That's when we want to be concerned and kind of Come at right. it from that perspective, yeah. No, I'm, what, what I'm speaking of is like, you know how people say if they have a bump or a bruise, oh, they immediately go through the, they go through the worst case scenario. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm saying. You know, um, I've had people say, I must be getting Alzheimer because you forget a name. No, yeah. that's not ne- that's not necessary. Yeah. So this, this, you know, people can't. It's, it's like that's there's no I'm separation. Saying. Yeah. Any t- anything that happens with the memory is people will consider it Alzheimer's or dementia. Right. When and that's just because, yeah. Mm-hmm. They should, sometimes they have nothing to worry about because it's just... Yeah. It's natural. Yeah, it's just right. natural. Yeah. Right, right, right. All right. And yeah. again, that's just that's just the culture we grew up in. We 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 don't we misdiagnose things and we misstate things as something and then we... Right. Well, let me the come turn it happen, around. You know. So, okay. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That answer, I've been happy. I've been, uh, that's been a something I've been wanting to ask for about 20 years. No Thank problem. you very much. Uh, Miss Wilma? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm Miss Wilma. <laughs> hi. I, I, uh, I you, you'll be able to take it down. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. I uh, was on the time before and I had started to take the, the medicine that the, um, doctor prescribed for me mm-hmm. and I've been on it for about 40 days and I take it at night and right. you did say it was a good medicine yes ma'am but the, he said that you're going to have these weird dreams and it's yeah. so true yeah. that you have these weird dreams and I was thinking about not taking it anymore right. because I um I just felt that the weird dreams are uh, uh, just a little bit too much uh, but um, I'm supposed to go see him in April, mm-hmm. and then I'm supposed to get my head examined uh, in April for some headaches and things like that. Right. I've only had one small stroke in my lifetime, and so I don't think that have anything to do with it. 
right. at all. Yeah. But um, when, as you were talking, I was thinking about my mom before she passed. I don't know about Alzheimer's, but she became so frightened in her, after, in her older age. She mm -hmm. became so frightened and she wouldn't go anywhere by herself. And it was a lot, you know, uh, I guess because she had 10 of us, it was a lot of pressure on her at that time to raise us mm -hmm. and all. But she never appeared to have, because she used to sing a lot and sing her songs and all. And, and she was a religious person and everything. But I was just thinking about, does fear have something to do with, with uh, Alzheimer's? Yes. Hold on. Miss Wilma, how vivid are the dreams? Because I heard about that too. Yeah. Are, they wonder, are they wonderful? No, they're, they're different things, you know. Um, some nights you don't have them and some days you do. Uh, one time I had, the last one I had um, was when uh, we were trying, like, since it's Women's Month, I guess I had that on my mind. And when I went to bed that night, and uh, and I woke up. Um, my I had my, I always had my sisters in these dreams, and we were staging a, st a standout or something like that for the women, and uh, it was raining and all of this stuff coming down, and I and I by being a teacher, you know, a, a preschool teacher, I, I always have children in my dreams. Also, you know, something about the children. I'm trying to save a child or I'm trying to teach a child, uh, or they reminded me if I'm working, with, when I would teach them the, the, how to do the month, how to do the month, the days of the, the year of the, of the uh, week, you know, things like that. I only have one real bad dream, but basically those are the type of dreams that I've had so far. Yeah, they said they were real vivid. That's what I, I was wondering. Yeah, they are vivid. They really the are. Can you tell, can you, can you discern that the dream is a dream versus being the real thing? That's the only thing I worry about. Yeah, you know it's a dream. Yeah, I know I'm, when I wake up, I might be, wake up in a sweat or something like that. And when I wake up, then I know that, uh, especially if my alarm clock go off, wakes me up. And uh, uh, I know that it was a dream. I also been, uh, would dream about my son that passed on uh, about, seven eight years ago when I got killed and sometimes I dream about him as being a little boy you know things like that that's the kind of dreams I've had since I've been on the medicine yeah uh-huh yeah. but I really was getting scared about it one time I yeah, was I mean, thinking the, about being frightened about it because I what he said it doesn't stop your Alzheimer's or anything like that but yeah. it gives you some type of um yeah you know, it helps you be, you know, how to slow it down. That's what his words were. Yeah. Because my spelling is off. You know, sometimes my spelling is off. And that's what made me go to the neurologist. Yeah. My spelling was off. And uh, yeah, and and I, I used to love to read. And so now I'm trying, I'm going to have to, you know, I love the way you said, you know, put reading in there and take uh, and do more games. I am doing word games and you know, card games and things like that. So, but I'll, I'm gonna I'm get back. I, you know, I read the Bible, but I'm gonna read some good, some, a good novel or something Definitely. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, I think we have one more and then we wrap up Ms. Uh, Durban Washington. Yes, thank you for taking my call. I have a question. Um, someone mentioned that stare in the eyes of a person with dementia. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say something about that? My husband has advanced dementia and yeah. he sits with that stare. But if I do something to get his attention, really to get his attention, then he will come out of the stairs like he's in a fog or thinking about something way back when. Yep. And when I get him to come out, then the stare goes away. But oh, yeah. unless something is done to really pull him out in conversation or something, that stair stays in. What is that stair? What is going on? So is it that you have a few different things. Um, you have the called the flat effect, right? And again, it's just the brain shuts off. It's just a thing that happens, right? You see it um, commonly, right? I usually associate that with high and low energy. So we call it sundowning. Sundowning is when a person is really active and engaged during the day, 
and then at a certain point at night, they become despondent and they just kind of check out, right? So the brain only, especially when you're talking about the disease, as you get to, to your point, advanced stages, middle to late, right? The brain can only do so, do so much within a certain time frame, right? So you get them when you get them and then they're great and they're high functioning and then they essentially exert all that energy out for the day and then they're just kind of there. And as you progress through the disease, you'll see a person kind of go through these quote unquote highs and lows where they're great and then they just kind of go, they have these moments where they're kind of just checked out and that's just a part of the disease. So there are a lot of different names for it. It's very common um, for people at the middle to late stage of the disease. And it's not, a, it's not a bad thing, like it's not affecting them in a way. It's just kind of shutting their brain off as it were. So Are they aware they, of anything when they're shut off like that? Are they aware of anything in their brain? Um, some, some, some are and some are not, again, because, you know, we don't want to say the wrong thing because everybody who's going through it experiences the disease differently. They're aware, right? They're just checked out. No different than a person who daydreams and dozes off, and then you got to get their attention. It's, it's similarly the same effect. Okay, that's a good yeah. uh, scenario. Yeah. I understand that. But I just have one other question. What yes, I do is encourage the aides to engage him so that he mm -hmm. won't be off like that. Right. Um, and when they work to engage him, he's not off there staring. So right. am I doing the correct thing? Am I hurting him by en engaging him to bring him here with us? No. I mean, and again, you just have to read the situation for yourself, right? If you ever felt like it was something that was hindering his ability to be potentially in danger, then no. If it just happens from time to time, then it's fine, right? But again, of course, you just want him to be as engaged as possible, right? Because there are going to be moments where he may need a break, and that's just you kind of assessing the situation as you see it. There's other times where you might want to pull him back because you want him to be engaged with you in that moment. And you just use your discernment on when and how you want to kind of pull him in when you see necessary, right? So, so you yeah, made that's not to me. I appreciate that. Okay, yes, um, this is Teresa. Sorry, but we're pretty close. We're way past Mr. Watson's time. We thank you for his excellent um, presentation, as well as the additional time he spent with us. So I'd like to just say thank you, Mr. Watson. We'll see you in a month or so. Yes, and, and for all of you, if you have questions, um, you know, just hold it for his next visit with us.